Good evening, Scott Lane with SAMHSA. Welcome to uh, the San Antonio Bible-Based Science Association. Um, so I don't forget, Ed, would you like to lead us in prayer? Because you always have to remind me. I was going to remind you after you... Understood. You know. All right. Lord, we come to you this evening. We thank you for an opportunity we can gather here and that uh, we can explore your word, explore things that sometimes we ignore on purpose and sometimes not. We explore subjects that you have directed us to take a look at that impact our lives one way or the other. And I ask that you would guide this meeting and be with us as we continue on. And these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items and do one order of business before we start tonight's program on DNA battles. Uh, that is... Wake up. Get with me. There it is. Uh, we will be talking DNA battles. We're at the historical... Modern genetics says that, modern genetics can tell us quite a few more things besides just that about my Adamnip and being historical, and we will look at that tonight along with seven scientists and two theologians. Before we do that, uh, we do have two more months to go with our current uh, Genesis Academy a presentation that's actually four lessons. If you were to join, you actually could watch all lessons that are now available online uh, through Feast. If you're interested in this program, talk to me afterwards because I have to get you RSVP through Feast to get you onto this program. But we're going to be running that. We've got two months left in, in this uh, 12 session, uh, te video teaching sessions. There are 12 half hour programs which really do a great job of covering Genesis so 1 through 11 from a creation point of view. As we said tonight, we'll look at DNA battles, we're having the historical. Next month, universe battles, big bang or big design. May, earth battles, how old is it? June, testing evolution. Carl, you came up with what I thought was a good idea for July, possibly. What would that be? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about it. We'll it's, it's a video you transferred that, <laughs> that uh, had some issues, but it was good enough in one format. But we'll look at that. We'll look at that. Uh, I thought we delivered a great one last time, uh, and, it's about, and it's available. I think I've got the copy here tonight. Uh, I thought that. Uh, uh, who, was, who was that from last time? That was from Answers in Genesis, and I thought they did a superb job. Now that was an 11-year-old video, but they did, but they did a great job of covering that. Uh, and of course, we had a what I thought was a very good article in last month's newsletter covering that topic. Prayer concerns: Relief in the world from COVID. Thanks for the vaccines arrival. Heal our nation from civil unrest and violence in cities. Pray that our nation heals and comes together after this very divisive election cycle, that God will heal this land. Pray for protection of the First Amendment. That, that, those are just some ideas for prayer. If you have others, please tell us. We'd love to pray for them. I'm hoping that you're getting our uh, communique newsletter each month on email. If not, there's a sign-up sheet on the, on the back table that you can sign up anytime this evening uh, before you leave, and we will get that emailed to you each month. There are also hard copies of the newsletter sitting back there. On that newsletter, testaments to the miracles of God's designs, quick pop quiz, how is the human reproductive system like a seahorse's? If you read the newsletter, you'll figure it out. Uh, and also an article on the clarity of Scripture. Clarity of Scripture. How, how can we even be assured that we can understand Scripture? That, that's the top. And really, the, our whole ministry and the ability of people to be saved by God's Word is dependent upon that. 
And so that's an article we will look at along with our Genesis commentary, Genesis 7, 6 through 24. All of that along with all the creation opportunities in the San, greater San Antonio area are still in this month's newsletter. Do remember that uh, we're on KSLR radio and 11 other markets in the U.S. and 120 countries with the Leading the Bible program. You can see this month we'll have Dr. Shahardi for the first uh, two sessions. Then we go this COVID food evolution and racism and cancel culture. We have two, the end of this month, we have two very topical and current uh, discussions that will go on during our 14 minute uh, radio program. I believe, let's see if that covers all of my, yeah, that covers everything that I've got to go into before we go, with one exception. Is there anything anyone wants to bring up before we go into one piece of business and, excuse me, our program for the evening? It's great to see all of you. Board members and uh, people who are here, you're welcome to feed into this as well. Board members, we have had a, a uh, proposal from West Star Communications. What they propose would be a somewhat radical change in how we in how we do media and how and how we do things. Uh, they propose that our website be revamped. Uh, that proposal, I think I'm going to follow through with whether we adopt these people or not. Uh, because I've gotten a lot of feedback that there's too much print, it's too stale. Uh, the whole reason for that is, is because I'm one of the two webmasters and I'm too cheap to buy uh, uh, anything but freeware in terms of what I'm programming with. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably buy, I'm going to buy a, a program where I do not have to invent everything in Lexus in the background. A Lex, excuse me, in the background. And make the thing have much more pictures, less verbiage, and uh, a, li a little more sound bite, a, a, li a little more attractive. We'll do that. That's one of the things they wanted to do because what Westar wants to do is drive everything back to our website. They say that you want to continue with your 15-minute programs. Have the 15-minute programs linked on the website, which we do. We have them linked with podcast and KSLR. But those 15-minute programs withdraw your radio spots to where you're not on, to where you're not doing WWCR. You're not doing the 10 other spots across the U.S. You're only doing San Antonio for KSLR. But now. Invest five in five to ten, two to three minute spots that they can get on to 100 to 200 stations across the U.S. Plugging for to as kind of teasers to get them into a little bite of creation science or biblical apologetics. Lead them back to the website where they can get more. They can get more of the radio program, etc. Simply look at that, pray on that, digest that. Our current budget, incidentally, for radio is approximately $1,000 a month. Wow. If we were to go to Westall, that's what we're spending for a month for, for, the, we're getting for the places we're on. If we were to go to Westar with their proposal, it would take us $1,770 a month. Wow. So that would, be, that would be great sponsorship as well. I'm not sure about it, but I wanted all of y'all to hear about it, digest on it, pray on it. And we will discuss that in the near future. <laughs> Any other business before we start the evening? How are you raising that money? Do we do quit your table? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> My wife would allow out to. I could cut an extra seven seventy a month. It's just whether or not she would allow it. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the best way for us to go. I do. I do think we need to revamp the website. And met, and and because my son just talks about well, I see reading and he he flips to another website. And he's thirty he's thirty three. Okay, this isn't somebody who's twelve, even though he looks like it if he looks like it if he ever shaves. But, Scott? Yeah. Years ago when I was doing webmastering stuff for the personnel center, their big thing was three clicks at the most. And not being as busy like even what we have up there yeah. on the screen. Three yeah. clicks. 
Yeah. Well, you get. Here's where you want to go. See, I, I, I've gone through all sorts of programs and, and training. There are people who will tell you you need to get so minimalistic to where there isn't a single word on any slide on a presentation. It needs to be just one picture. No. Uh, they've gone too far. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you do fill it like that, that's more than somebody's going to take in, even if I do let, let, leave it on there long enough. Right. Okay? Uh, all we did here was show you all the programming that's coming in the next few months. There's a middle ground in there somewhere. Hopefully. Yeah. But my concern is the uh, maintenance of uh, If we go much further than where we are, it's going to take a lot of your time to run the yeah, Well, that's why I have to go out of freeware. Because if I went to the point where I could just drag and drop and let it write and Lennox in the background, that's fine. Our current freeware will not allow that. There are programs that will allow that. Yeah, but still. Uh, but I have to buy it. Yeah, scrubbing databases. And making sure links are understood. All right. Pray about all that, guys, because we need to input that. Let's go back. To, let's go back to DNA battles because that's what we came here for tonight. This is the first in a series of. This is the first in a series of documentaries that we're going to show you from Evidence Press. Uh, each one of the programs over the next three or four months is from Evidence Press. Uh, well, we're going to actually you're going to have the opportunity at the end of next month because their founder, Jim Bendewald, we are having on radio for three consecutive programs at the end of April and the first Saturday and night on KSLR. We've interviewed him. Uh, you've seen one of the videos that he's done. Because last year we showed Echoes of the Jurassic, and that is a product of Evidence Press. Okay. Uh, tonight you're going to see another one of them called DNA Battles, which talks about whether or not uh, Adam and Eve are historical and goes into other parts of genetics, along with people who don't talk favorably about creationism. They try to, they try to talk to, to both sides on this. At the end of the evening, if somebody's in love with this video, I do have one copy for sale. I'm also, man, I picked those up. What did I do with them? I thought I brought them back with me. Now, I was going to start something tonight. There they are. Got those two things. On top of our free stuff, what I'm going to start each uh, time we meet. Is have a warning gift for anyone who wants them. At the end of the evening, if somebody wants to come up and get the video of Fire My Bones, all you got to do is claim it. This, incidentally, is the biography of Ken Ham. Yeah, and then if you want the book, Will, Will They Stand? This is a book by Ken Ham which talks about how do you get a kid through middle school, high school, and college and still believe in God. It's a, it's a toughie. If you, if you would like either of those, just talk to me. These are, these are free giveaways at the end of the evening. Let's look at DNA battles. The book, Adam and the Genome, was financed and promoted by Biologos Foundation. A Christianity Today 2011 article reports that Francis Collins 
founded BioLogos to promote theistic evolution. BioLogos has become very influential, especially in larger churches. The Adam and the Genome book, published in the spring of 2017, raises a number of scientific and theological questions for which most Christians do not have answers. The science of genetics is very complex and it's hard to wade through. According to the Christianity Today article, noted Old Testament scholar Bruce Walke lost his job at one seminary over making this statement. If the data is overwhelming in favor of evolution, to deny that reality will make us a cult. Well, that's a very bold and honest statement. It shows that Walke affirms the importance of truth. But this quote raises some very important questions. Is the evidence overwhelming for evolution? Where does the empirical DNA evidence lead? Which side has the truth, scientifically and theologically? The historicity of Adam and Eve is an extremely important topic for ordinary people to grapple with and to study. In this documentary, we get straight answers directly from scientists and professionals who have studied these issues. We also put it in an easy to understand format. I'm Jim Benderwald, the director of Evidence Press, and this is DNA Battles. We're Adam and Eve Historical, I believe it was you who introduced me to the book, Adam and the Genome, and you recommended that I read it. Yeah. Why is that? Um, because that seems to be the primary resource that BioLogos is popularizing. So the people in High Point Church who are, who are pro-evolutionary, one of their main spokespeople came to me and said, Nick, you really should read this. You should look at the, you should watch all the videos from the BioLogos conference that were on this book, and you should read this book because you really need to, and, and what that person said to me, and, and he, he's a very sincere believer, I, I believe. He said, you need to get up on stage and you need to tell people mm -hmm. that um, the human race is between 200,000 and a million years old, mm -hmm. that um, evolution is how God supervened to make human beings, and you need, to, you need to say this stuff on stage so that we don't alienate intelligent, well-educated people, be, and because in his case, um, he had watched somebody come to our church, see that we were insufficiently committed to an evolutionary understanding of history in, in this particular woman's opinion, and that caused her to leave. I think just to go to another church, uh -huh. but it caused her to leave. Right. And that really grieved him, and I can understand that. Yes. Um, and so that w w that's part of what was driving him, and I, I totally get that. So I read the book. And I thought that since this is the main resource that, was, that they were popularizing, I thought that since I know you would not agree with the content of that book, I feel like when, when views are talking to each other, they got to talk to each other. And so, you know, we should be reading as good a purveyor of each view as we can. One of the books that we're talking about in our documentary, Dr. Dennis Venema co-authored Adam and the Genome. I would say that his main message is to Christians that the evidence in favor of evolution is so strong and so powerful that, hey, you Christians, you seminarians out there and pastors, you need to wake up to the evidence in favor of evolution and, and adjust your theology to match up with the scientific evidence that he's presenting. How do you respond to that assertion? Well, it's not true. As a geneticist and a biologist and having studied the issue for many years, the evidence for evolution is just not there. We don't see creatures changing into other creatures. We don't even see it at the DNA level. In the book, Adam and the Genome, so a fairly new book came out in spring of 2017. I reviewed that book in the, uh, the Journal of Creation. Okay. I, I believe that's the harshest book review I've ever written. In fact, I reread it about six months after it came out and I was actually surprised by, by my harshness, but it deserved it. I was upset with the book for a number of reasons, one of which was having to do with things like, uh, in the book itself, he doesn't actually use the expression junk DNA. Oh no, he doesn't. But he, he does describe leftovers, and then he goes on to say that the predominance of evidence supports this idea that 
that there's these leftovers. Yeah, I found that a very, very curious absence. Um, Francis Collins, who's also associated with Biologos, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Venema also, mm -hmm. um, he's pretty much come out and said now that the junk DNA argument was a bad argument, and yet that was one of his primary arguments back five and ten years ago uh, when he was writing, when he wrote his several books on the subject, junk DNA was it. That was the answer, and this is why evolution is true in his mind. Mm -hmm. Now he said, well, okay, I shouldn't have said that. So Venema now writes this new book, mm -hmm. and he doesn't use that phrase junk DNA, and yet he uses all the, all the ideas of it in the book, and it was, that was very telling that there's something going on. Go ahead and explain junk DNA. Give a little bit of history of junk DNA so that uh, some other people understand what we're talking about. Um, in the 1950s, a famous evolutionist named J.B.S. Haldane, he um, started doing mathematical studies on evolution. And he was looking at um, how much natural selection could drive change over time. And he concluded that even given millions of years between a common ancestor with humans and chimpanzees, you can only get thousands of differences. And it's a puzzle, it's now called Haldane's Dilemma. Mm. It's a long-standing evolutionary puzzle. It's been going on now for 60 years or more. Um, and there's no mathematical solution to it. There's not enough time. Even with millions of years, there's not enough time for selection to make millions of changes. And there are millions of differences between humans and chimpanzees, like tens of millions. So the solution seemed to come in the late 60s and early 70s from Japanese uh, population geneticists. They came up with an idea and then another one, uh, he named it, called junk DNA. And the idea is this. If your genome, which is all your DNA, only about 2% of it actually codes for protein. Therefore, 98% of it is non-functional. This is the idea. Now, this is, this is the dark ages of genetics here. They had no idea what they were talking about. But, you know, early 70s, they say only 2% codes for protein. Therefore, the rest of it can mutate at random. Natural selection doesn't have to cover that stuff. It's just junk DNA. You can mutate and change whatever. And then selection now can only focus on the few important bits and they thought they had solved Haldane's dilemma. The whole idea of junk DNA, it's been around for many years and evolutionists would just say the stuff in between our genes is just leftovers from our evolutionary past, you know, that we don't really use anymore. Only about 2% of our DNA is really functional in doing something. But you just cannot support that scientifically anymore. It's, it's a real blind spot, actually, for a lot of evolutionists in that, because it totally does not fit with what they believe about the past. You've got evidence, like, literally staring you in the face, and it's almost like they're putting their hands over their eyes, their fingers in their ears, and saying, nope, I don't believe it, it's still not true. And it really gets me, because we're not talking about, you know, something in the past, we're talking about something in the present that you can actually observe and understand and see that it has function, yet you're still saying, well, most of it's still non-functional. Most of it's still not doing anything. It just, it, it just shows you that this is not an issue of the evidence um, because the evidence is clear. It's really an issue of worldviews and wanting to maintain their worldview in spite of glaring evidence that it cannot be true. So I'd like you to tell us about pseudogenes and why they're so important to the evolutionist argument? Well, pseudogenes uh, were first discovered as being somewhat similar in sequence to real protein coding genes in various genomes. So most animals and plants have these things called pseudogenes. They bear similarity to protein coding genes that also exist in the same genome. Well, evolutionists said these have no function because they don't code for a protein. It's just a genomic fossil. Pseudogene is a term that was coined back in 1977. Okay. And right after that, it was postulated that pseudogenes are a remnant from our distant evolutionary past. And in the 1980s, it really took off. Pseudogenes were the answer to those creationists. Pseudogenes are some of the genes that we don't use anymore, and animals don't use anymore, but we carry around anyway. Well, of course, all of these evolutionary ideas when we get more data that comes in, get debunked. And so pseudogenes are being totally debunked because as it turns out, pseudogenes are transcribed. RNA copies are made from these that are functional and that work in the regulation 
uh, many times of the protein coding counterpart of that gene. But they, um, they don't look like they can code for protein. But what we found time and time again is that even though this one here doesn't code for protein because there's a couple of mutations in there, it'll still be turned into RNA. And that RNA will actually interfere with this other gene here. It's a, it's a regulatory mechanism. This gene, even though it doesn't make a protein anymore, in the evolutionary sense, the creation sense, no, it was never meant to make a protein. So pseudogenes are actually important features of the genome mm. that function in the regulation of the genes that they're similar to, as, as well as probably other genes. Okay. So, so really, pseudogenes are not pseudogenes at all. That's a, a ridiculous thing to call them. They're long, non-coding RNA genes that do important things. In fact, they found out that when certain pseudogenes are dysfunctional, you can get things like cancer and various types of human disease, heart disease and things like that. So hmm. pseudogenes are hmm. critical components of the human genome designed by God. So Venema basically has this long, this major argument saying that, well, there's these pseudogenes that go from one type of animal on up to through a series of animals leading up to humans. And so because he's considering them to be mutational, non-functional, the point is, well, how is it that it also appears in humans? So Dennis Venema likes to promote the vitellogenin, or VTG for short, pseudogene argument for human evolution. So vitellogenins are a type of lipoprotein that egg-laying creatures will make. It's part of the egg storage proteins and the energy reserves for the hatchling that comes that develops in the egg. So Venema claims that humans have this VTG or vitellogenin or egg-laying pseudogene in their genome it is a remnant of evolution, something we shared in our common ancestry with, say, chickens or birds. Well, I researched this to see if his claims really held water, and it turns out that what he is talking about is a 150 base region, only 150 bases. Now, the chicken VTG gene, or vitelligenin gene, specifically the one that, th that this supposedly corresponds with, is over 42,000 bases long, and that doesn't even include the control regions in front of the gene. So we're talking about 150 bases of DNA that Venema is claiming is a remnant of an egg-laying gene in the human genome. So I began looking at this 150 bases. Well, it's only about 62% similar to a specific region of this VTG gene, so the similarity is very low. On top of that, this 150 base DNA segment is actually inside an important gene in the human genome that's expressed in the brain. Not only in developing babies, but in human adults, it's expressed in brain tissue. And not only that, but this region, this 150 bases, is called an enhancer element. So it actually functions in the expression of this gene in the human brain. It binds transcription factors, and it's involved in the control and regulation of this gene. So this so-called 150 base fragment that represents a pseudogene is actually an enhancer element that's a functional feature of an important gene that's expressed in the human brain. It has nothing to do with laying eggs. So I want to talk about another book. Nathaniel Jeanson wrote a book called Replacing Darwin, and it was published in um, the fall of 2017. Jeanson is, uh, I would say, primarily talking about mitochondrial DNA. He's, he's done a fair, fair amount of research. I think it was eight years going into uh, writing this book. Would you say that his evidence is, is good quality evidence? Is, is he a good quality scientist? Dr. Jeanson is brilliant in a word, and he has done incredible work in the area of stem cell research in that little Bible college back east called um, 
uh, Harvard University. <laughs> and I do appreciate all of the work that Dr. Jeanson has done. He is very meticulous, very cautious in the kind of research that he has conducted. So I think that he'll be vindicated, even though he is a lowly creationist. Uh, the work that he's done is just outstanding. Jeanson's work is right on. It's been uh, corroborated by Robert Carter and John Sanford. And there was a study in the late 1990s done on mitochondrial DNA where secular evolutionary scientists found an age for the mitochondrial genome of 6,000 years, hmm. which would put us down at the creation date as discussed in, in the Bible. So everything that creation scientists like Jeanson, Sanford, Carter have been discovering interestingly have been validated previously by evolutionists. Mm -hmm. So their data is totally valid, it's totally solid. Tell us about your new book, Replacing Darwin. I wrote a book that I wish I had when I was a, a student to give away to my friends who were evolutionists and thought Darwin had settled all the questions. So then the book's divided into three parts. The first deals with Darwin's risk that he took when he wrote The Origin of Species. He tried to answer a fundamental genetic question without any genetic data at his disposal. That's really rem remarkable if you think about it. Who would have tried to answer microbiology questions without a microscope? That's, that's basically the analogy. It's really tough. So the second way, the second part of the book, deals with a, another element of Darwin's risk, and any scientist's risk. You propose an idea. Science can only disprove. So you try to identify those competing ideas. You disprove those. And if yours is still standing, you try mm -hmm. to disprove your own. If it's still standing, you, you go with it. And then the last part of the book, half the book, is what does genetics tell us about the origin of species? And I think it tells us some really fascinating answers uh, about the time of their origin, the questions of ancestry. You can even talk about geography a little bit, how species originate. And what I describe in the book is a very different answer than what Darwin articulated. Next, I'd like to discuss mitochondrial DNA. Explain what mitochondrial DNA is. Within our cells, there's multiple different compartments that do things. It's, it's like a veritable city. You have all sorts of sub-functions and, and, and subsections of the cell that deal with trash, that synthesize new things. It just goes on and on. It boggles the mind, the complexity. Well, the mitochondria are basically the energy factories. Mm -hmm. So when you digest something, it goes to your stomach and to your intestines, absorbed in the bloodstream. Bloodstream passes around these digested nutrients to your body. And the mitochondria then extract energy through complex chemistry from these nutrients to then power the functions of the cells, which powers the function of the tissues in the body. So me moving my hands right now is due to mitochondria. Me, my heart pumping right now is because the, the heart's mitochondria are using the energy that I fed it from my last meal. And humans have mitochondria, animals have mitochondria. These are called the, the, um, the powerhouse of the cell. These are the things that, right. that, that convert sugar into energy. You have about a thousand of them, more or less, in each cell. There's these little things, they're all throughout the entire cell and they're making ATP. They have their own little piece of DNA. And more importantly for the question of humans, you could trace migration, you could trace ancestry, you could really ask, begin to ask and answer some very interesting questions about our origins with this small section of DNA. So it's inherited only through moms, Basically, all the differences that we see would have to be due to mutation because dad isn't contributing anything to that mitochondria, just mutations over time. And so not only can you trace migrations and, and who arose first, which ethnic groups arose first, you can trace time. When do they arise? But the, the mitochondria, their, their chromosome is a little more than 16,000 letters long. It's tiny compared to the nuclear genome which is one of the reasons why some of the first studies on human evolution used mitochondrial DNA because it was easy and it was high copy number, they could work with it. Um, so way back in oh, 1987 or 1988 is the first paper on, um, on the out of Africa theory based on human mitochondrial DNA. And then evolutionists will of course extend it back further and say, well, how does this fit with chimpanzees and other species and, and gorillas? So there's all sorts of things you can do with a small genetic compartment and do it in a very powerful way. Several years ago, a friend of mine had was trying to convince me that the Earth is old and was using mitochondrial DNA as evidence for an old Earth, old genetics. And so the article at that time was, was basically supporting his view, is that, look, uh, we can essentially count back some 200,000 years or so. Since then, I believe in 1998, where they began to start saying, wait a minute, 
the mutation rate is much faster than what we thought it was and uh, was affecting the outcome. Go ahead and explain maybe a little bit further. History and technology plays a big role here too. So you think about the history of how we came to know more and more about mitochondrial DNA. The first thing that happened was we got the sequence. No, don't have any idea how fast it mutates. The first sequence is the early 80s. And what comes before that? Geology, fossils. Even before the 80s, the evolutionists had established in their minds that we came from some primate ancestor several million years ago. Uh, the first human-like fossils in Africa, so we must have come out of Africa. And they had this time scale set out. Now you've got a DNA sequence and you've got, you, you go forward a few years, you've got more DNA sequences from people around the globe. What they take then is the number of DNA differences, apply them over the already established evolutionary time scale, and then conclude oh, here's the rate at which DNA changes. Well, that's not actually a scientific conclusion, that is a scientific prediction that rests on the validity of the evolutionary time scale and the validity of the DNA differences. Well, the DNA differences, I think, are valid. Uh, the time scale obviously deals with historical science and, and a whole bunch of assumptions worked into it. So it's only been recently, beginning in the, in the late 90s, that we've been able to test that prediction and say, is the rate at which DNA changes from mothers to daughters and daughters to granddaughters and, and every generation now in real time, does that rate match what you'd predict from the fossil record? So if humans supposedly originated 200,000 years ago and there's, let's say, 80 differences today, you can predict how fast DNA should mutate per generation. And then you can go find grandmothers and granddaughters, mothers and daughters, get their DNA sequences and then count the number of differences to empirically verify whether or not that mutation rate is true. And it was a big shock to the scientific community in 1997 when this Nature Genetics paper came out saying, well, this is way higher. The actual rate at which DNA changes suggests Eve lived 6,000 years ago. And that's been vigorously debated within the evolutionary community for the last several decades with 10 to 20 papers that have come out disagreeing with each other, no one has been able to make heads or tails. But if you, if you take all the data together, say we're not going to leave anything out, we're going to conservatively go at the best data, weigh it by their statistical power, you still get a rate that fits exactly the 6,000 year time scale and rejects the evolutionary time scale. You know, somewhere in that range I would have been happy, but in fact it, it, it looks like it's right in the right ballpark for, for the biblical number. The evolutionary number is much bigger because their mutation rate is wrong, hmm. because they assume common ancestry and they don't actually prove it. We live in an era where Fortunately, there are a lot of um, mitochondrial DNA databases available, especially on human beings, and being able to look at mitochondrial DNA from people all over the world. And so he's been able to utilize those databases to really look at um, how many differences are there among humans. You know, if, if like Biologo says and many evolutionists say, um, many other evolutionists would say, well, you know, uh, mitochondrial Eve, you know, she was around 100, 200,000 years ago. Well, does the DNA evidence really support that? And the answer is no, because there's really not a lot of differences in the human population in their mitochondrial DNA, which you would expect if she was hundreds of thousands of years old, or humans were hundreds of thousands of years old, but we don't see that. Instead, we see confirmation of a very short um, time frame of the 6,000 years that the Bible uh, informs us of. So in your book, Replacing Darwin, the topic of mitochondrial DNA is a very, very important um, Topic. This is probably your, your main theme of really what you're, what you're going for. Um, why is mitochondrial DNA data better than nuclear DNA data? I would say from a scientific perspective, neither are, it's not like one's better than the other. It's that we can't consider the origin of species without both the nucleus, nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA. Typically, when evolutionists discuss mutation rates, they're talking about the nucleus. When we talk about the origin of humans, and there's too many DNA variants, we're talking about the nucleus. And they tend to ignore these nagging exceptions that are in mitochondrial DNA. And what I try to show in the book is at least four independent lines of evidence. So I've got several invertebrate species, a fruit fly, a roundworm, a water flea. I've got a yeast species and I've got humans, so we've got a diversity of life. Look at the mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, the empirically measured ones where you've got mothers and daughters and so forth. All of those consistently point towards an origin of these species within the last few thousand years. And they reject this millions of years time scale. So I established that first. I said, now let's go to the nuclear DNA where we've got at least two different hypotheses to explain the differences that we see. Mutation and then God creating differences from the start. And 
let's evaluate their testable predictions. And the reason I, I bring up both compartments is they go hand in hand. If you take humans as an example, uh, or humans versus chimpanzees, the mitochondrial DNA data says mutations are happening way too fast. For humans and chimpanzees to have had a common ancestor six to 13 million years ago, the mitochondrial DNA data doesn't work. Then you turn around and go to the nuclear DNA data, and you've got mutations that are going too slow. So I bring up both compartments to say the evolutionists are going to have a hard time harmonizing these two. That's a real challenge. They might say, oh, natural selection over here, just arbitrarily. And then they go to the nucleus and say, well, you can't have natural selection because it's already slow. Natural selection is going to slow it down even further. I bring up both compartments to me. They go hand in hand because together is what really exposes the deficiencies in the evolutionary model and the strengths of the young earth creation model because I can explain and harmonize and predict in both compartments. Okay. Dennis Venema, I believe he primarily uses the nuclear DNA for, for his evidence. What do you think of what Dennis is saying using pseudogenes? Yes, yeah, so it is true the evolutionists use nuclear DNA primarily. They tend to ignore the mitochondrial compartment or chalk it up to some anecdotal strange anomaly that they haven't yet figured out. But their arguments from nuclear DNA, by and large, are either hypotheses stated as fact, or hypotheses tested in isolation, where they've failed to reject competing explanations. So let's say we're talking, let's talk about the first type. They'll say, let's look for, we, we expect from an evolutionary perspective there to be all sorts of junk, all sorts of evidence of an unguided, undirected, unintelligent process at play in our DNA. Whereas from a creationist perspective, a design perspective, you, you expect all sorts of function to be at play. So here they're aware of the competing explanation because it's a generic design hypothesis. Darwin was aware of design hypotheses. So in this sense, they're sort of acknowledging there's a competing explanation. And they say the evidence supports non-function. And then they take it a step further and say there's, there's shared non-function. But that, argue, that second part of the argument depends on the first. That's a hypothesis stated as fact because no one has actually vigorously tested human DNA for function. The way you do it, the gold standard for how you do this, is you knock out a piece of DNA and then see what happens, which thankfully is still considered unethical in humans. We're not going around asking for volunteers, I'm going to remove your DNA and see if you die or live. <laughs> you can do this in animal models much easier and ethically than you can do in humans. And so if that's the gold standard and you can't do it, well, obviously no one's on the test. Instead, what people have done is um, biochemistry, basically. If there is some sort of discernible function, we know some of the major pathways by which information is transmitted in the cell and how, how, with the way in which the nucleus is, acts as the command center for the rest of the cell, you can look for biochemical signatures of some sort of functional activity. That's the ENCODE project, and they found biochemical activity in 80% of our genome. To me, that's step one. Uh, the evolutionists have vigorously disputed it because it's obviously much higher than what they want it to be. And I say step one, first of all, because it's biochemistry, not genetic knockout experiments. Secondly, think about what our DNA is going to be used for and when it's going to be used. What we have in our cells, our six billion letters, three billion times two, is the instruction manual for 60, 80, 100 years of existence, starting from a single cell to an adult that ages with time. The most dramatic morphological changes, where I go from a single cell to 10 fingers and 10 toes and a head and a nose and two eyes, that happens from conception to nine months in the womb. And then basically what happens after that is growth and puberty, which are much less dramatic changes than single cell to this form. So you might expect from that perspective that most of our instruction manual is dedicated to that and then shut down because you don't want to be growing another hand and an arm for my shoulder right here halfway through life. So the ENCODE project, again thankfully, is not looking at these windows of development because that would require killing children in the womb. So I'm actually somewhat shocked that they found evidence for 80% of our DNA because my guess is that you know they're looking at cell lines, primarily adult cells, maybe a few embryonic cells, but you're not looking at day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way to nine months to say what's this DNA doing, which is primarily probably when it's going to be used. So the trajectory of these experiments so far is not favorable to evolution. There's a whole lot that has yet to be done, genetic experiments primarily, and hopefully this will be done in animal models rather than humans. People keep their ethics in place. But the experiments that have been done in humans, the biochemical ones, 
aren't showing 2% of our DNA that shows biological activity. It's 80%. That's a very different result than what you'd expect from evolution. That's why they're trying to downplay it so much. So the nuclear DNA, the, tra the trajectory of function of nuclear DNA is, is a strong hint that it looks very well designed and is not the product of undirected chance processes over millions of years. Okay, so let's get into the book, Adam and the Genome. Probably the fundamental question of, of Adam and the Genome is the historicity of, of Adam and Eve. Did they actually exist in history? And of course, they're saying no. What do you say? How do you respond to that? The book is broken up into two parts, a science half and a theological half. And Dennis Venema gets into the question, the genetics then of Adam and Eve. And three major lines of evidence, he says, argue against humanity coming from just two people mm -hmm. sometime in the past. He says it must have been a population of mm -hmm. several thousand or more. That was mm -hmm. the lowest it ever got. It's always been a population, but the minimum is several thousand, not two. And so therefore, you cannot speak of two original people at the fountainhead of humanity. Well, Venema's idea that the human population had to come from an ancestral population of about 10,000 individuals is all based on evolutionary hypothetical uh, ideas and calibrations. The question of Adam Eve is very difficult to disentangle from other questions. We've, we've, we've brought up some of these issues already. We have to decide what is the origin, the mechanism, the mechanistic origin of differences. Are they all due to mutation or is there another possibility that they were created from the start? In technical terms, you would call the standing variation pre-existing heterozygosity, that sort of thing. But were, were there differences within Adam himself? Was he created with the appearance of having parents? So I've got two different versions of DNA because I've got a mom and a dad that are different. Adam and Eve had no human parents, but God could have created it with them with the appearance of two different versions in Adam, two different versions of Eve. I think this actually fits the data very well. I think the, the main hypothesis the evolutionists don't consider is that within Adam's own DNA, there's no differences. That's essentially what Venema is arguing when he said there's too many differences to have arisen in 6,000 years. He says Adam and Eve, Adam had to have no differences between his DNA. So I have differences between my two copies, about one to three million differences between my two different versions of DNA in my cells right now because I got half from dad, half from mom. So when we talk about cloning, what the evolutionists are rejecting is differences within one body. And then if you've got no differences with an atom and Eve's made from a side, there, there's absolutely no differences whatsoever except for that X and Y chromosome. And so their, difference, their, their children would have looked almost 100% identical to them. No differences in skin tone, no differences in any of that. Just identical to Adam and Eve. That's the weird cloning element. When we typically use the term cloning, uh, you talk about cloning an animal in the lab, it's basically 100% DNA identical between parent and this cloned offspring. That's the sort of scenario that would happen if Adam had no differences from the start. If Adam had differences from the start, and then Eve is made from his side, but she also has the same differences as he does, you get all sorts of variation the way the math works out. It gets complex because you're dealing with four different versions of DNA and how you mix and match them. But that scenario produces tremendous diversity in a single generation and explains the DNA differences that we see today. So why do you believe that, that God would have created the differences within Adam? So normally, if Adam would have descended from a set of parents, dad would have contributed half of his DNA, mom would have contributed half of his DNA, just like me, and my mom and dad are different, right. and they contribute different DNA. Well, what do you do with Adam, who's got no human parents right. from which to inherit? So God could have created the two different versions, because he still would have two different versions, otherwise, you know, other chromosome numbers are lethal. So presumably he has 46 chromosomes, not 23. 46 chromosomes as if from two parents. Well, the question is, were those two sets of 23 different or the same? Well, if those are the same, and Eve has the same scenario, because you have to deal with that same question, does she look like she had parents, not look like she had parents? So if all four versions then, Adam has two different copies, I should say, 23 chromosomes for a total of 46, 23, 23, and Eve for a total of 46. Well, if they then reproduce, the only thing they can pass on is what they already, the same thing they already share. Ah. There's, there's no so there's new combinations that could arise. It's just okay. the same thing, the same thing, the same, every generation. So it's extremely logical then, genetically, 
so that there is variation, so that there is health among the species, and it will expand rapidly in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. But with uh, sexual reproduction, the idea is two completely different individuals coming together to form another individual, you're going to get more diversity, and that's what you want. Diversity is good because, especially after Adam and Eve sinned, then you've got mutations coming into DNA and problems. And, you know, um, eventually, you know, God said no more close relative marriage. And the reason for that was because you're getting, the more similar you are, the more likely you are to have the same disease causing genes and the more likely you are then to have a disease. And so that's why God forbid that. I mean, the Israelites didn't know about DNA, but God certainly did. And he knew that this was going to be a problem. So in the time of Moses, you know, he said no more. This is 2,500 years after creation. So it's actually finally built up to the point where it's now a problem. So um, yeah, I, I would totally expect if you've got two people and you're going to populate the entire planet from those two people, you know, over time, you would want them to be very different from one another. So if Adam has the first 23 that are one sequence and the second 23 that are another sequence, and then Eve has the same version, well, they don't pass on their entire DNA. If there's a mix that Adam's cells could choose from, so to speak, you can get a new version here and a new combination with Eve's. If you do the math, just based on chromosomes and now what we know about DNA, the number of potential varieties at the genetic level in their offspring is just mind-boggling. Dennis Venema, mm -hmm. has he looked at this, what you've, what you've stated or what, maybe what others have stated, um, have you read his comments? How does he respond to this other view which essentially wipes away his entire book, seems to me? The evolutionists have one strategy, or two strategies perhaps. The first one is to simply ignore what's out there and they don't even consider it, they don't read our literature, they don't test it, they don't engage it, they knee-jerk if anything, or if there seems to be a conflict, they point to other lines of evidence. It, it, standard fallback for decades. You find one area of conflict, you just change the subject. Or you move the goalposts, I've seen that as well. My practice would be to be like, to read them, right? And then I would say, I wanna see this subjected to scrutiny, right? Which is very difficult for young Earth creationist arguments because people don't want to do it. They don't want to do the work of interacting with them, right? Because if you're in the scientific establishment, it like hurts your career just to talk to people. Well, I'm saying young earth creationists are like, hey, will you read this article and tell me what you think is wrong with it? Correct. And for a evolutionist person in a university or something, for them to and even engage, yes. it's like, you know, it's like, it. yeah, yes. it's like engaging with Hitler or something. Like, it's just crazy. And like, you could like maybe not get tenure. I mean, it's really bad. You can just see the fear in people's eyes. I understand why evolution, evolution believing, even Christian scientists don't want to engage because there really is a cost for them, a real cost. So by and large, Venema has not engaged anything that the creationists have written. Uh, the times I've, the one time I debated him, he seemed to show evidence of not having read our literature at all, not having heard of it, and that fits the biologo school. They're not really interested in dialogue. They just want evangelical acceptance. They're not interested in discussing the science. They want to discuss, do you think I'm a Christian or not? And they want the answer to be yes. And they want the answer to be yes, and the way they try to get that answer to be yes is by schmoozing and coming across as nice people. And they have no interest in discussing the science. I think the central theme of the book Adam and the Genome is about the historicity of Adam and Eve. Did they actually exist in history? Their position is that they did not, that they were part of some 10,000 what they call hominids. What are the theological implications for taking that type of position? Well, first of all, you know, it's interesting. When you read the book of Jude, it says uh, Enoch was the seventh from Adam. And then when you read the other genealogies in the New Testament, it starts with Adam. So it doesn't start with anyone before Adam. They start with Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says Adam was the first man. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 says Eve uh, was to be the mother of all the living. Uh, so it's obvious there was one man and one woman. Uh, Paul in, in Corinthians, uh, helps us understand uh, that Jesus is called the last Adam. Uh, he takes the place of the first Adam. 
because the first Adam brought sin and death into the world. You see, if there were hominids before Adam, then you've got death before Adam. And, and that's what these people believe who authored uh, Adam in the genome, that there was death for millions of years before man. But the Bible makes it very clear that death is a consequence of sin. What are some of the theological implications of Adam and Eve not being historical? I think it's, it's catastrophic for the gospel because um, Jesus referred to Adam and Eve. He didn't say their names, but when he was asked a question about divorce in Mark chapter 10, uh, when he was asked by the Pharisees, he went right back to Genesis and he said, you're wrong about divorce. Uh, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your heart. But if you want to know God's perspective on marriage, you need to go back to the, to the beginning. And there God made uh, male and female. He quoted from Genesis 1, and then he quoted from Genesis 2 that marriage was instituted by God as one man and one woman for life. Uh, Jesus referred to uh, Abel being killed by his brother. He referred to Noah and the flood. And many of these uh, cases, Jesus used those events as, a, as, a, as a, a warning or a promise of something he was going to do during his earthly life or in his second coming. So you undermine the history of those first chapters of Genesis. You undermine the truthfulness and the authority of Jesus. What, what they're proposing is that, like the evolutionists, that it all started off with like 10,000 hominids. But then the implications of that, theologically, are just horrendous. Yes, well, Romans 5, you see Paul's contrasting two heads of humanity. Adam brought sin and death. Jesus brought righteousness, righteousness and life. If Adam didn't bring death um, in the world, uh, why is there death? Mm -hmm. What did Jesus come to do? Well... First and foremost, it, it, it very much goes against what Scripture says. Scripture doesn't say there was 10,000 people. It says there was two. And, um, and for me, I mean, there's lots of points we can make with that. But I think when you get to the New Testament and you read in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and the passages there that talk about the relationship between the first Adam and the last Adam, well, <laughs> if there's 10,000 people, who is this Adam? I mean, most... Most of those that are members of Biologos would not believe in an Adam and Eve, a, a strict, you know, just two people. Um, they might believe they were two, some of them might believe they were two of the 10,000, you know, but more and more what I'm seeing is they don't even believe in that. Um, and so it's, it's like, so then how do you interpret the, that, those passages in Romans and 1 Corinthians where there's a clear link between what, because of what Adam did, because of what the one man, it says, did. It doesn't say what 10,000 people did or, you know, what one man of 10,000 people. It says what this one man did is why we need Jesus Christ, you know. And so there's this definite linkage there between the actions of the one and of Adam and the actions of Jesus Christ. And so... You know, if Adam isn't real and didn't fall and didn't sin, then it really takes away our need for a savior. Mm -hmm. And so that that's probably my biggest issue is that I think so many Christians think it doesn't matter what you think about Genesis. You can think whatever you want. And I'm like, is that really biblical? Because the Bible makes it clear that there's a link between those two. And so if we take away the history and that, that foundational history in Genesis, it's going to have consequences for the gospel. See, it's important to understand the message of salvation, that we're descendants of Adam, and Adam sinned, that's why we're sinner. There, with sin came death, Romans 5 says that, and that's particularly in regard to man, but Romans 8 says the whole creation groans because of our sin. If you believe the fossil record, which is full of death, it's full of evidence of diseases like cancer and brain tumors and arthritis, and it's got evidence of animals eating each other and being aggressive. If that existed millions of years before man, then what did Adam sin do? And not only that, after God created Adam uh, and, and Eve on the sixth day, he said everything he made was very good. So if you've got all these millions of years of death and disease before sin, and, and it means God said brain tumors are very good and cancer is very good because that's what you find in the fossil record. So really it's an attack on the character of God hmm. because you're blaming God for death and disease instead of blaming our sin. And so if we don't have a literal Adam, an individual 
who was rebellious against God and really fell in sin and was judged by God, uh, then we've destroyed the whole basis for why Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to solve the problem of sin. And if Adam wasn't a real person, then what is sin? Uh, my selfish behavior, my violence against others, that's just part of nature. I mean, lions rip gazelles apart. So what's the difference if humans rip babies apart? You know, there's no difference. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians seem to be very ho-hum about this issue of creation. Like, to them, it doesn't matter whether God created in six days or used billions of years. It's like, well, this isn't a, a salvation issue, and so why get all that concerned about exactly how and when God created? How do you respond? Well, creation is the foundation of the gospel. God created us in His image. We're not like other animals. We are created in the image of God, and, and the importance of that is that there was a literal Adam. Adam did fall from perfection. He did rebel against God. We do have a sin nature or a tendency towards evil and sin that we inherited from mm -hmm. a real Adam. So why did Jesus Christ come if, if we descended from apes? if we're just another animal. He came because we need a savior and it's all based in the book of Genesis on a real Adam that really existed, that really sinned, that really fell from perfection. If you take away the historicity of Adam and Eve, you wreck the gospel. The foundation is just completely gone. Right. It's like, it's not just the gospel, it's the entire Bible. It's, like it's Bible. right, it's the entire Bible Every, at the beginning of, of Genesis. So in these critical opening chapters of the book of Genesis, it talks very clearly about us having been created in God's image. Well, that's far and away uh, opposed to what evolutionary naturalism says, that we have our genetic roots and some primal ooze billions of years ago. So that really is a very graphic difference between these two worldviews. I think it's significant that the Lord Jesus also spoke with authority several times in the New Testament regarding the authority of the book of Genesis, the book mm -hmm. of beginnings. Mm -hmm. He didn't try and make it an allegory or poetical. He spoke as it was real time history. So the issue here is authority. Is our authority going to be what God has revealed in his word, the Bible, or is it going to be secular science? So this debate is qualitatively different from the other debates in the church about baptism and Calvinism, Arminianism, the millennium. All those debates presuppose the Bible's our authority and we're trying to work out what this authority means. But when it comes to the creation issue, it is the Bible our authority when it comes to science and history, or it must, must we go to secular science to give us the true history of the world? Big issue today, young people they're leaving their homes to go to college and they're not necessarily coming back to church. What are some things that parents can do to help instill that faith back into their kids' lives or just young people in general? What would you recommend that they, that they study? We believe that the single most important um, influence in a child is, is the family. What we think we see is that families that engage on this topic, that actually talk around the dinner table about these issues, that churches that teach, you know, teach the controversy. Look, here's this, what we're dealing with. You know, here's 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 an open question. How do we handle this? Here's a biblical answer. Uh, children who are schooled in that sort of thinking are much less likely to walk away from Christianity when they hit that. 18, 19, 20 year old zone. Do you have a quick definition of biblical hermeneutics? Well, hermeneutics comes from the Greek word that's almost identical to that, and it means to interpret. So um, there are principles that we use to interpret any kind of literature, uh, like context, grammar, um, and so um, it's very important that we we understand how to interpret literature. We don't just go 
go to it and say, well, I think it means this. No, the author had an intended meaning, and the, the goal of, of good hermeneutics, of good interpretation, is to understand what was the author trying to say. What can churches do to help people learn about hermeneutics and apologetics? Well, this is, this is uh, absolutely critical today, and most pastors are not teaching these things because they went to seminary and, none, and they didn't have a class on it. And we, we need to right. teach people in the church how to defend the faith, how to properly interpret. And the pastor should be developing mature people in the congregation who know how to read the, the scriptures on their own and interpret them faithfully. And uh, my fear as I look at what's going on in the church is that we're, we're heading rapidly into the same kind of conditions of the pre-Reformation where scholars are basically in, indirectly saying, you can't really understand the Bible on your own. We'll tell you what it means. We're seeing the, the Bible is being robbed from the people in the pew. Oh, they need to teach it. I mean, we've, we've got so many opportunities for that. And, and I think a lot of it is because people aren't taught hermeneutics. They're not taught how to in interpret scripture properly. And so when these other people say, well, I think scripture says this, you know, or some big name teacher or leader, even within Christendom, they don't know how to discern. You know, we, they'd say, well, you know, if that's what they think the Bible's saying to them, or, you know, that's what they're being led to believe, it's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not okay. You know, we need discernment. There is a proper way to interpret this in an improper way. And, and it's not just up for grabs, and you can interpret it however you want. So it is definitely important. Hermeneutics is something that, you know, people find it more difficult than watching TV. And so part of this is just encouraging and inspiring people in the church to just want to go deeper, not just in terms of biblical information, but deeper just in thinking more clearly and doing the kind of hard work of figuring stuff out. Before I went to college, I read a book by Donald Carson called Exegetical Fallacies, which is all about mistakes you can make interpreting the Bible. And there were like, I don't know, there were like 50 different mistakes you can make in that book. It's not a very big book. And I read this book four years into doing ministry with people, and I realized I had made every single one of them. So what do you consider to be the place for apologetics and hermeneutics in Christian churches today? Well, I think one of the problems that we've got in a lot of our churches is the fact that uh, kids have today what we just call Bible stories. And I see a lot of pastors who are sort of recognizing that younger people today aren't that interested in the Bible like they used to be, so they're, they're trying all sorts of things with entertainment and spiritual lessons from the scripture and so on. What we've lost is that the Bible is a book of history and it's history in geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology right at the beginning is actually foundational to the whole of the rest of the Bible. And what the church needs to be doing is saying, we need to be teaching the Bible as it's meant to be taught and we need to, we need to be teaching generations how to answer the skeptical questions of this age. I found the more that I've answered these skeptical questions of this age that undermine the Bible and attack the Bible, young people are, are just fascinated and they're interested and it's really pointing them back to the Bible and saying, look, the Bible's not just a book of stories. It's a book of history. You can trust its biology, its geology, its astronomy, its anthropology. We can answer these questions that you have today and to point them to the fact that now that you understand that its history is true, then the gospel, the morality, the doctrines that are based in that history are true. The evidence for creation is biblically and scientifically sound and faith-affirming. It's likely that pseudogenes are mislabeled because many of them have been found to be functional, like the VTG pseudogene Jeffrey Tompkins discussed. We found from Nathaniel Jensen that mitochondrial DNA empirically provides consistent measurement of life going back just 6,000 years, not hundreds of thousands of years, as Dennis Venema and other evolutionists claim. While Venema says the nuclear DNA evidence has humanity starting with a collection of 10,000 hominids, Jensen says the DNA differences can easily be accounted for by God placing those differences within Adam and Eve when he created them. This means that the evolutionist argument for requiring 10,000 hominids is completely empty. 
In fact, Jensen's research demonstrates that repeatable data from mitochondrial DNA supports life from humans just 6,000 years ago. As Robert Carter said, somewhere in that range, I would have been happy. But the fact is, it looks like it's right in the right ballpark for the biblical number. So we see that Jensen's empirical evidence is a complete reversal of what evolutionists claim. In addition, we found that Jesus and the Apostle Paul were very clear that Adam and Eve were real people. As Terry Mortensen said, so if you undermine the history of those first chapters of Genesis, you undermine the truthfulness and the authority of Jesus. Christians need to realize this is not just a Genesis issue. This is a Jesus and a biblical authority issue. Thank you for watching. You can learn more and share your comments at dnabattles.com. Also, please share this program with a friend. Now, for some of you, that might have been a little dense uh, in, terms of, in terms of the scientific the science itself. Let me recap a little stuff, explain a little bit and then we'll have discussion yeah. here tonight. Uh, the book they started talking, out, uh, talking about was Adam and the Genome, written by a guy named Venema from Biologics. Some people get the, uh, confused because there's two groups that are kind of battling in America. One is called kind of Biologos, and the other one is called Logos. <clears throat> Logos means the word. the word or the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, Biologos is a group uh, which includes a uh, former head of the National Research Society, uh, and they believe in an old earth. They generally believe that God created, but He let evolution do it over billions of years. Logos is a group that says, no, God created exactly like He said in Scripture, <coughs> and that there is as we saw here, great scientific evidence to support that. That Logos group includes a friend of mine, Bruce Malone, as well as uh, Dr. John Sanford, mm -hmm. who, when he retired, was the was probably the preeminent uh, plant geneticist in the world. Uh, they won't, don't give him credit for that now because he's gone to the dark side. He's become a creationist since then. Uh, but you have, Venema wrote this book. Now in it, he described things about waste and useless parts of the DNA. He wrote this book after 2006. In fact, he wrote it in the last decade. And what's real interesting in that book is, due to the ENCODE project, and that was a project done by multiple labs across the world, they took sections of about 750 base pairs. Now that's a very small part of our DNA when you know that you have over 3 billion base pairs in each, in each set of your DNA. They took 750 pieces uh, and took them out and saw what didn't work. And when they did that, they found that, ooh, it's not 1.5% of your genome that is functional, it's over 80%. And as Jensen said, and, and Dr. Robert Carter said, we're happy they didn't go beyond that because their feeling at the end of the ENCO project was it's probably 100% functional, but we're not going to do the experimentation on the other 20% to find out if we can kill a baby mm. during, during gestation while it's being constructed. Give them time. Uh, <laughs> give them time, right. But again, he, in his book he was describing junk DNA even though the research had debunked that a decade earlier. Uh, yeah, they talked about Hal Dane's dilemma. They talked about Hal Dane's dilemma, uh, which basically said more than 50 years ago, there's not enough time for all to get the kind of changes you need to develop from a chimpanzee to a person in the amount of even if you give them a million years or a billion years, there's not enough time for all the changes that would have to occur. Um, Huh? All day. All day. All day. All day. Haldane's dilemma. Dilemma. <coughs> dilemma. There's actually, if you go to our, if you go to our archive, there's actually a uh, 
article on Hal Dane's dilemma done from 1999, I believe, by Ernie Hernandez on Hal Dane's dilemma. Uh, Dr. Robert Carter was a, a good friend and a, and, a, and a good guy. If you really want understandable stuff on this He's genetics, right. he's got a video out called Mitochondrial Eve and the Three Daughters of Noah, really which good. is back there. Really and if you good. want to buy it, you're welcome to get it. If you can't find it, I'll get it for you. Uh, and that, incidentally, that's one of three things that I'm going to go over that, that, that was not mentioned in this video. Uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen from Answers in Genesis, you heard from a whole lot. He has a book out called Replacing Darwin, which I do have back there, and you're welcome to buy. Um, one of the biggest thing they were talking about was, in terms of the E syndrome, one of the things that they found when comparing mitochondrial DNA from people all over the world is, is that they all seem to go back to one primordial form, one primordial set. They call this the Eve syndrome. They don't like to talk about that in the vernacular anymore. They try to erase that one. It's like being Karen. And I don't ever know how Karen got to be a bad name. But anyway, <laughs> in, the, in the vernacular right now, Karen's bad. And, and mitochondrial Eve is bad. But what it shows is the DNA all, from all people is so related that it shows we all came from one original female. That's called the E syndrome. And the amount of differences shows that it happened about 6,000 years ago. Which is fine for the Bible. What's the problem with that with evolution? Oh, it's nowhere close. It's nowhere close. Okay? Now, one of the things that's going on with this is when they first started getting into, okay, it's mutations, and we're going to see how many mutations that would occur. So they looked at the differences between, between mitochondrial DNA and, and regular DNA, and they said, okay, well, it looks like there's about 2,000 to 4,000 differences. So if you have one difference per generation every 20 to 30 years, that could compute out to 200,000 to 300,000 years, which fits the evolutionary time scale. Problem, when we actually started, to, remember Robert Carter saying back in the 50s to 70s, they were in the dark ages in terms of genetics. They didn't know what they were talking about. There was very little experimental. Very little experimental. Now we've really found out how many mutations fix themselves per generation, per individual. We find out it's not one. It's closer to 100. Yep. 100 to 200. Now, when you start talking 100 to 200, that shortens down the time immensely. So we're talking about the mitochondria. Huh? We're talking about the We're not only talking about mitochondria, we're talking about differences within Y chromosome and main, and main body DNA, both. Okay, nuclear. nuclear. Nuclear DNA as well as mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Okay? Now, what was not made clear here is we also have evidence for a primordial atom. If you look at the Y chromosome, compare Y chromosomes by males all across the planet, they show a large amount of differences, but those differences at a 100 to 200 uh, mutation rate per generation can date back under 10,000 years to one primordial source, not five out of the old out of Africa theory, but back to one individual atom. Both of these support the biblical account. No. Now, the other one that they did not mention, which is in Robert Carter's video, mm -hmm. is that one of the interesting things about mitochondrial DNA is yes, we can trace it back to where it looks like it all came from one original set, E. But there are three subclasses of mitochondrial DNA. Somebody tell me a biblical account of why there would be three subclasses. The flood and Noah's children. The, the flood and there were how many three daughters? Three sons, and three, daughters. three sons and three daughters, which restarted the population. If the biblical account is correct, we should see three different classifications. And we do. Three subclasses of mitochondrial DNA. Very clear. 
Um, and the last point they made was that old earth and, and no Adam and no Eve does violence to the gospel. Boy, you get to the point to where you start saying, okay, well, all that stuff in Genesis 1 through 11, that was just allegory. Those were just stories. And the problem comes from this, folks. One, when do they start telling you the truth? In John? Yeah. Yeah. Where do they start telling you the truth? And two, if it's not the truth, why did Jesus and the, God, and the apostles all refer back to it as truth, as truth more than 100 times? Yeah. Okay. Your thoughts and questions on all this? Yes, sir. Well, a lot of thoughts came up. It's real, yeah. really thoughtful. One at a time. Uh, well, the first thing that came up is, like, even, like, since 2007, we found, found new uses that DNA takes that we didn't know about, um, like, hereditary co coding where, you know, a mother doesn't get much food, well, the, the generation after is going to be short, you know, things like that. So, so yeah, that 80 percent, even just from what we found, very easy. Um, the second thing I hate to note, just in the more discussion on religion is that that it, it, there's a difference between a poison and an act of attempted murder. And that's something we should keep in mind when talking to people who are who are poisoning the gospel with stuff. They may sincerely be trying things, they may sincerely be believers, but they are engaged in drinking poison that will kill their faith. One of the things that I was taught when I first got into this over 35 years ago uh, by Dr. Bill Tierney, a biology professor at Air Force Academy, he taught me you can believe evolution or you can believe creation, but you cannot believe both. Not only is the order of the Bible and evolution completely different, the foundations, the genetics, the science, everything is different. And the expectation is what you're going to find in reality is different. And what I did after, because I at that point I was a theistic evolutionist. I believed God just planted the cell on here and let and let it go. And what I found after 15 months of research was that's junk. Absolutely. That there, there, there is no scientific substantiation for this. And then I realized the damage it did to the gospel message. Other thoughts? Well, I think that even just from regular common sense. Ladies, you don't have to be afraid, but if evolution were true, you shouldn't be afraid. You'd be just like the X-Men, have blue hogs jumping out and, you know, uh, tentacle arm babies, you know. <laughs> Why has that never been observed? Because evolution is not true. And we got over 6,000 species of creatures in accredited zoos around the world, and not one has ever had an evolutionary transition come out. Okay. Or you would have heard about it all over. But they've never been able to prove it. So evolution is from common sense, pure poppycock. When he says that, let's make one thing clear that uh, the evolutionists will charge us with, which is a straw man argument, and it's wrong. What do not hear from him that we say speciation does not occur. New species come up all the time. There are multiple species of dog. We're even making more species now because we're going to breed them and, and do different things. Speciation occurs, but what you don't have is a cockroach becoming a mouse. You don't have a mouse becoming a bird and a bird becoming a human. Because what does it tell you 11 times in Genesis chapter 1? Everything was, was made according to its time. There are distinct kinds. And its seed was in it. And its seed was in it. And, and, and it's transmitted. There's a wide amount of variation that was pre-programmed into those kinds. The kinds can vary greatly, all the way from a mastodon to an elephant. But not a mastodon to a human. We have a forest rather than a tree. We have a forest rather than a tree. And that's due to the, the uh, idea that speciation is varied. That's the problem. The definition of speciation has not been settled in the scientific community. No, they, they don't want to settle it. ICR right now has a project trying to settle on speciation, on what that actually means. 
Other thoughts and questions about what we just saw? You'll know, you'll, while you're thinking about that, you will note why, with the last section they had about the theological implications, why we have a section in this month's newsletter on the clarity of Scripture, on your ability as a priesthood of the believer to interpret Scripture for yourself. The Holy Spirit allows that. God printed, made the word so it could be interpreted by you. Yes, sir. I, I thought that they could have encouraged the speakers to slow down a little bit. Yeah. Jesus. Their, speech, yes. they, their speech was just so fast sometimes yeah. that you couldn't get all their phonemes. You couldn't get them. You couldn't get it all. Now, do understand, because I know most of these people. Between Jensen, Tompkins, and Sarfati. You add them up and they've got 540 IQ points. Um, so slowing some of them down is, is tough. But, they, but, they, but they, need, they do need to slow down. They do need to slow down. It was a little fast. That's why I said it was a little dead scientific. Even for me, I'm, and I'm so experienced with this. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about before we end the evening? I wish I, wish I could make this it slowed down in a way that would that I could communicate with my former wife. But this doesn't. <laughs> I, I do have one comment. Yes, sir. I, I did really appreciate that them taking things into the scientific method and really explaining the kind of proper methodology of thinking. Because when we're talking to people who might be, you know, that intermediate level of understanding of things, it helps a lot when we can actually speak that way. A very true statement. One great example of what you're talking about. It was assumed for 50 years that the mutation rate within us, ooh, and brought up something that I, I wanted to make a point of, and I'm going to now. It was assumed that our mutation rate was always about one mutation fixed per generation because that's how long it would take to make all the changes from a hominid to us. The problem was that was not a measured rate. That was not science. That was an assumption based on the math. Okay? When they did the real science, the real observation, the real experiments, they found out that we are varying, that they're, that are, they're occurring within our genome yeah. somewhere between 100 and 200 mutations per generation, which blew that out of the water when you did real science. Here's what's real interesting that came out of Dr. John Sanford's work. Another one of the reasons why they wanted to believe that there was only one de uh, deleterious mutation occurring within our genomes per generation was that if you get above one per generation, you get declined to the point to where you cannot have a moving forward of any speciation. You're going to get deterioration to the point to where everything will become extinct. And incidentally, folks, that's what's actually occurring. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. Uh, Sanford. Sanford's work shows us that within the next 6,000 years, if Christ doesn't come back, and I have full faith, he will come back long before then. Mm -hmm. But if he didn't come back, it wouldn't matter because we would all be extinct. Mm -hmm. Because of the degeneration that's going on, not only within human genomes, but within every animal and plant genome on the planet. Well, that's naturalistic processes. But if man with technology intervene, that's why Jesus has to come back soon. Right. In order to prevent man from, from countervening that na natural process. If we can. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we close the evening? When we do, on the back table again, if you're not getting our uh, newsletter electronically, please sign up so that you can. On the right hand of the table are free materials. If anyone does have interest in Ken Ham's Firing Your Bones or Ken Ham's Will They Stand on how to get kids through uh, high school and college, please come and get these. And there are paid materials on the left hand side, including the two things we talked about earlier tonight. Next time, I didn't put it up there. Next time, we will have Universe Battles Big Bang or Big Design which is a documentary by this same group, the same group. Let's pray and then go, and then please do look at the materials on your way out.
Lord God, thank you for this great group. Thank you for the answers we're getting in terms of the vaccines and moving forward. Let us not Amen. get to a point to where we to where we are taking for granted what you give us, nor understanding that there is still a threat. Let us be cognizant of that. Protect these people as they go home Amen. and also allow them to evaluate your words and apply it in their lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks.